All right, welcome everyone. This is Dr. Clark from Center for Weight Loss Success. Today on Losing Weight USA, we're going to talk a little bit about manipulating hormones for weight loss. We kind of hit on this topic a little bit almost every single webinar. But we're going to kind of put this all together, kind of what are what are many of the hormones that will um, uh, will actually affect weight, and what can we do then about kind of manipulating them in the right direction for weight loss. All right, welcome to Losing Weight USA, real-time answers to your weight loss questions. Some of the latest research as well as a little bit of expert advice. You should have not only direct access to me, but you should be receiving the health, the health tips and recipes via the membership portal. And yes, I encourage you get into the membership portal. It's where we keep adding more and more things, all the educational materials, all the educational webinars. All right, very good. So let's get started again. We're talking about manipulating hormones for weight loss. Let's get this on. Go. There we are. All right, there we go. Very good. And so let me get into this here. All right. So, yeah, no matter what, now weight loss is hard. Weight maintenance is hard too. Weight maintenance may actually be harder. Weight management, the bottom line is it's difficult. If it were just as easy as just saying, okay, let's eat a few less calories, then weight management would be very easy. It's not that easy. And if you know, if it truly were that easy, I wouldn't have a job. Many things influence weight. But, you know, can some of these, can we actually manipulate? And we can manipulate some of these things with surgery, okay? But we can also manipulate some of these things hormonally too. And so today we're going to review some of the hormonal influences on weight and then how you can potentially manipulate them to improve weight loss. And this is something that's probably pertinent for just about everybody. Now, lots of things influence weight loss. It's not just how many calories you're taking in. Again, if it were that simple, I'd just tell you, eat less, you, I wouldn't have a job. So lots of things influence weight loss. We're going to hit hormones, but I'm just going to list some of these things that influence weight loss to keep in mind that there isn't any one thing, okay? Um, you're overall metabolism, how much lean body mass, when that's direct, lean body mass directly affects how your metabolism is, what your age is, what are your medical problems, because all the medical problems will influence weight as well. Most of the medications that treat medical problems will influence weight. Just whether you're male or female, what's your ethnicity, um, which medications are you on? Genetics does play a big role here, and we can't obviously change some of those things. But then there's also physiologic stress, how active we are, how much we exercise, how sensitive the carbohydrates are you. Are you insulin resistant, which is incredibly common? What are, how are you exposed to in your environment, whether it be through your entire lifetime, kind of we're exposed to all kinds of different environmental toxins? And so actually, yes, it affects weight. Vitamin, nutrient deficiencies, they're going to affect weight. Vitamin D is one of the biggest culprits there. Um, and half the population runs around low on vitamin D. Food allergies or literally any type of inflammatory reactions can affect weight, typically makes weight go up. Um, but there are also food intolerances. And then finally, there are things in our environment that are appetite stimulants. They stimulate us to eat more. Okay, so lots of things influence weight. That's the whole point of this slide in the beginning of the discussion. We're going to hit on the hormonal side of that. Okay. So yes, hormones influence weight, and lots of them do. And I'm kind of listing them out. Insulin tends to be the master hormone at influencing weight. So we typically almost always come back around and talk about insulin. We're going to talk about it today as well, because insulin really does. If we if you don't control insulin, it's going to be very difficult to control weight. Um, controlling all the other hormones is helpful. But if you don't control insulin as well, then yeah, it's going to make it so much harder. But so the other hormones that tend to influence weight, thyroid hormone, 
estrogen, progesterone, and just a, a sequence of menopause. All women will go through menopause at some point. And yes, it tends to be a weight gain period of time. Testosterone influences weight, cortisol, growth hormone, and then some other ones we don't talk as much about, ghrelin, leptin, HCG. G, which is human chorionic gonadotropin, which goes way up during pregnancy, um, but has been utilized for help with weight loss uh, and it's, you know, in the past as well. Not so much uh, um, in the recent past, but uh, some in the past still. All right. So with all hormones, balance is absolutely key. And I say this over and over again, is that really, you know, anything low, anything too high typically is not going to be all that helpful in influencing one hormone potentially can affect other hormones too. So with all hormones, just keep this in mind. Balance is absolutely key. Now, hormones are secreted by endocrine glands. And so when we say the word endocrine, endocrine just means, okay, they make hormones. That's what it basically means. And there's a lot of endocrine glands within the body, um, ranging from up in our brain with the pineal gland. We talk about the uh, pituitary gland all the time. I mentioned that, but also then in the brain, the hypothalamus around your thyroid, too, there's the parathyroid glands, there is the thyroid glands, there's your thymus, there's adrenal glands. Um, your kidneys secrete hormones as well. The pancreas secretes a number of important hormones. The testes in men and ovaries in women, they secrete some of the sex hormones then. So all of these endocrine glands are going to produce hormones and they will affect weight. And for some of them, then we can manipulate some of these. So what is a hormone then? Hormone is basically just a chemical messenger. It's a chemical messenger. It uh, allows communication between one part of the body to, the, to another part of the body or potentially the whole body too. So they're chemical messengers. The endocrine glands, they make the hormone, they release the hormone into the bloodstream or into the local tissue, okay, but mainly into the bloodstream and subsequently then the bloodstream carries this hormone throughout the body and it provides a message to certain target tissues. And only the tissues with the receptors to that hormone are gonna respond to the hormone. And it's kind of that lock and key phenomenon that you have to have the hormone go to the right receptor in this tissue. So a lot of things have to work for this to all to occur. And hormones are basically one of the main tools your body uses to maintain balance or homeostasis. Homeostasis, big word that basically means you're you know, balanced throughout. When I say balance, not like, gee, I'm tipping over balance, but it's kind of keeping everything in balance. And again, hormone balance is absolutely key. All right. Now, I'm going to digress here for just a second, basically normal levels versus optimal levels. And I've kind of brought this up in a number of different webinars is that typically normal levels just mean that you're, you fall in to 95% of the population. Okay. And opt, excuse me, uh, normal levels really have nothing to do with optimal levels. Optimal levels is where would we function our best? Okay. Those are two different things. Can a normal levels just mean, hey, most of the population falls in this range and you do too, you're normal, as opposed to an optimal level, which is where would our body actually function its best. Those are two different things. And just realize that for whenever you know, your physician checks some level on something, that normal does not necessarily mean optimal. There are two different things. All right, so we're going to start with thyroid hormone. People, uh, you know, thyroid hormone, it's one of the most common abnormalities because this is a very common abnormality. It usually is not the reason why someone's way overweight, although it's very important to figure that out because if it is the reason, it's a very easy fix. Okay? Um, reality is about 20% of women, and probably that percentage is low, it's probably closer to 40% of all women will develop thyroid problems, much more common in women than in men, but anybody can get it. Okay? It's just much more common in women. Thyroid hormone directly affects your overall metabolism. So kind of how do we, you know, 
break down and utilize everything. So directly affects your overall metabolism. Low thyroid, which hypothyroid is low thyroid. Low thyroid then typically then means you have a slow metabolism. Okay? And it typically can lead to symptoms, weight gain just being one of them. But other symptoms of low thyroid, dry skin, uh, hair loss, hair changes, depression, fatigue, cold intolerance of cold all the time, forgetfulness. If you're a woman, that can be heavy cycles, puffy face, loss of eyebrows, kind of the brittle nails, constipation, muscle aches, and lots of different symptoms go along with low thyroid. Most of those symptoms that I just discussed are kind of vague type of symptoms. Okay? What it is, it can affect weight. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's relatively rare that this is actually the treatable problem, but just realize again, it's common enough that it's, it, you should be checked for that. Most primary care physicians, you know, at least do a screening test probably once every year or two in most patients. Certainly, if you already diagnosed with thyroid problems, they're going to check it even more frequently. There is some um, help just uh, keeping your thyroid optimized with thyroid support. I kind of talked about that in the thyroid discussion or webinar. Thyroid support typically is going to have a combination of a number of things that can help make your thyroid work more efficiently and effectively. Uh, it's usually going to have a little iodine in there. Selenium um, is one of the elements that typically can help the thyroid function. There may be some herbal things in there, and they can actually be helpful. So kind of don't think that just, gee, they won't help. So yeah, they actually can help your thyroid work more effectively and efficiently. All right. Insulin's the big one, okay? Insulin's the, the big one that I talk about pretty much all the time. That is the master hormone when it comes to uh, weight and overall health. We can control insulin levels. We can control health, weight being part of health. Insulin's a hormone that's released by your pancreas, and its main job is to help with blood sugar control. So if blood sugar goes up, insulin goes up to bring blood sugar back down, help bring blood sugar back down. But insulin also causes problems. And therefore, insulin, I often say, is a, a hormone we can't live without. So zero is always a bad number. If you have, truly have zero uh, insulin, then you're going to have to have insulin replenished or you basically slowly die. Okay? So insulin is something that's very, very important to everyone but controlling those insulin levels can be even more important as far as controlling our overall health. Because basically insulin, it turns on lipoprotein lipase. The lipoprotein lipase turns on fat storage. And so insulin truly controls fat storage. Main job is controlling blood sugars. Yep, we can't live without it. But if insulin levels are too high, and that's what insulin resistance is, and it turns on fat storage and we basically store fat and this is outside of how many calories you're eating you, know, you could be eating low calorie but if you're eating if what you're eating or if your insulin levels are still elevated you're still going to really struggle losing weight and it's going to be really easy to gain weight insulin also tends to cause some problems so even though it's a hormone we can't live without High insulin levels cause other problems and basically it causes worsening of all inflammatory changes. Okay, so any inflammatory condition is worse in high insulin levels. But insulin also causes water retention, so basically, you know, swelling. Okay, it increases blood pressure, it increases cholesterol, helps increase triglycerides, it worsens any type of inflammatory condition. Now, the good news with insulin, though, is insulin is one of the easiest hormones to control. The bad news is easy doesn't, maybe I should say simple, is the good news is you control it relatively simply. That doesn't mean it's easy to do because it is actually still hard to do that. And it's because a lot of things that make insulin levels go up are things that we tend to like a lot and things that tend to be almost 
you know, like a drug that we utilize. And it basically came in a low carbohydrate diet. I like to say that everyone has a tipping point in their carbohydrate intake. You, you, you take in too, you know, this many carbohydrates, you're going to struggle. Okay. And every individual, it's going to be a different number. So it's not a way for me to tell you, okay, here's the number for you versus you versus you. It's something you have to slowly figure out. Okay. And it takes some work to do that. But it basically a low carb diet and controlling insulin is key there. Low carbohydrate diet, carbohydrate makes insulin levels rise the most. Simple carbohydrates do it the most. And so even though I don't necessarily want you to be on no carbohydrate, because some of the healthiest foods are still carbohydrates, the vegetables, the salads, the colorful vegetables, those are kind of the healthiest foods out there. Um, they're typically low calorie, but they do, they're carbohydrate. Anything that is a plant is literally, carb. that's a definition of a carbohydrate is it's a plant. So if it's a plant, it is a carbohydrate. It's just how well we utilize it or not. And some carbohydrates we don't necessarily make, it doesn't make blood sugars go up real high. The broccoli, the cauliflower, the kale, the lettuce, they don't make blood sugars go way up. They can raise blood sugar a little bit, but really not too much. So biggest ways to control insulin is a low carbohydrate diet. Now, low cal, some other things that will also influence insulin in the good direction to, to control insulin levels, keep insulin levels low. Other things, low calorie. So literally anything that has calories in it will raise insulin levels, uh, insulin levels. Uh, carbohydrate tends to do it the most. So with that, low carb has to be part of that low calorie. Exercise helps lower insulin levels, and that's especially why with type 2 diabetics, it's extremely important for those to continue their high activity, high exercise. Any treatment in the world isn't going to work nearly as well if they're not really active. Other things, quality sleep. And part of the reason is that, that uh, poor quality sleep increases cortisol levels. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then controlling stress. Same thing. High stress, kind of cortisol levels go up, insulin levels go up. And then finally, and one thing that is, I think, is one of the most important things of controlling insulin is what I refer to as meal timing, meaning that we need to have eating times and also not eating times. The important part of that statement was the not eating times is that it should only be a very short period of time that we're actually eating during any 24 hour day. And this is where fasting comes into play. Fasting just means not eating. Okay? And literally the longer period of time we are not eating, the lower our insulin levels go. Whenever we eat, insulin levels go up. And so just the fact that even if you're eating the exact same quantity of food, quality of food, if you eat it two different ways, meaning literally at two different meals, as opposed to eating a little bit all throughout the day, eating two distinct meals works a lot better than nibbling throughout the day, even if it ends up the exact same calorie count, quality count, uh, that type of thing. So that meal timing is very important. We need to have non-eating times, it's very important. All right, so shifting gears a little bit. Other things, other hormones that affect weight. Estrogen, progesterone, menopause. Basically, all women, this is going to be 50% of the population, right? Okay, so all women are going to go through menopause at some point. Okay? Um, men will go through, referred to often as andropause, in that their testosterone levels fall. But actually, this is pertinent for women, too. Their testosterone levels fall as well. But during menopause, basically, the ovaries quit working. When the ovaries quit working, estrogen, progesterone, as well as testosterone levels all go down very low. They typically don't go to zero, but they go very low. And the reason they don't go to zero is because the adrenal glands can make a little bit of estrogen, a little bit of testosterone. Now, one of the biggest culprits of weight gain is progesterone. The most common side effect of progesterone is weight gain. That doesn't mean it affects everybody, but for many women, they're on progesterone. And this can be whether it be in a 
birth control pill, progesterone in a shot of whatever kind, or GM on progesterone creams or whatever, no matter how you're getting it, progesterone, one of the most common side effects is weight gain. Outside of the weight gain, progesterone itself is a very safe hormone, is that you can take massive doses of progesterone, and typically it doesn't cause problems outside of the weight gain side of the whole thing. All right, well, what about the estrogen side? Estrogen is actually fairly weight neutral. Now, humans make three types of estrogen. I go into this more detail in the estrogen discussion on one of these webinars. So we humans make estrone, estradiol, estriol, sometimes referred to as E1, E2, and E3. That's where the names came from. Estrone is one, di is two, tri is three. It makes sense. So estrone, estradiol, estriol. Yeah. So, but as you go through menopause, approach menopause, so basically means the ovaries are failing to work anymore. That's what menopause is. And so the estradiol levels go way down. Estradiol itself is relatively weight neutral in fairly normal levels. Estradiol in really high levels you gain weight like crazy. But most women don't have that problem unless they're artificially taking lots of estrogen. Okay? And that's part of the reason why in our hormone replacement, we try to keep estrogen levels as low as possible that fixes night sweats, hot flashes, vaginal triangles there. So, but estradiol is relatively weight neutral in normal levels. Okay? estrone and just realize that okay so when you go through menopause then now the estradiol levels are really low unfortunately estrone levels tend to actually increase a little bit during menopause estrone is a hormone that's not only made by the ovaries but it's actually made by the fat cells and estrone makes it easier to gain weight and this is true in both men and women Okay, it's just that for men, the estrone levels are fairly low too. Um, but estrone is made by fat cells. It typically encourages weight gain, fat storage. And the more so, you know, if you think about this, then the more fatty tissue you have, it actually is easier to gain weight. And that concept is very, very real. Okay, sometimes I think, gee, you know, a larger person ought to be harder to lose weight, but actually that's not true. It's actually easier for them to lose weight. Part of that is the hormonal influence of the estrone because estrone is made by fatty cells and it actually encourages easier weight gain. And so this is something that is working against you. I realize that, but uh, we can, it's hard to keep that under control. Testosterone, so both testosterone is an important you know, hormone for both men and women. And as we age, both men and women, their testosterone levels, you know, they go way down. That's true for both men and women. And just to put this into perspective for women, often women think of testosterone as a male hormone. It's not. It's a female hormone, too. Yes, it is a male hormone, and males need much higher levels because we're not as sensitive as women to, uh, to testosterone. But women need testosterone. If I could measure all the testosterone that a woman made throughout her lifetime and compare it to all the estrogen that a woman made throughout their lifetime, they actually make more testosterone than they do estrogen. So the point there being is testosterone is actually an incredibly important hormone for women. Women typically make about 10% of the amount that men produce, but that's because men are much less sensitive to it. Okay? So insulin resistance, okay, we talk about insulin resistance and testosterone. Insulin resistance stimulates the ovaries to make more testosterone. And this is one of the the problems with PCOS, which is a very common hormonal problem. PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, typically we see weight gain, infertility. Um, with that, part of that is, yes, that testosterone levels may be higher, so they tend to get extra hairs and more acne for women that have PCOS. But the worst part is, is that the insulin resistance is much worse. Okay, but reality is, is that it affects pretty much all women. Okay. 
Testosterone, when we replace testosterone for both men and women, testosterone by itself typically does not produce weight loss. Okay, often big. That doesn't mean testosterone won't help with weight loss, but by itself typically doesn't produce weight loss. Um, typically, testosterone will help with weight loss in the long term, like over years and years. And then part of that is because it helps maintain our lean body mass. Our lean body mass really drives our overall metabolism. So over an extended period of time, testosterone can help with weight maintenance, but also kind of weight loss in the long run by keeping our metabolism high as possible. But that's not a short-term thing. That's over years and years. Okay. Low testosterone symptoms are very similar between men and women. Okay. That's, you know, low like fatigue, uh, decreased libido, um, weakness, poor sleep, joint pain, depression, worsening inflammatory conditions. These are all low T symptoms. We think of low T as a male thing, but actually, again, it's, uh, it's a female thing too. So what can we actually do to help improve testosterone levels without actually getting hormone replacement? which can also be done, that's part of what we do around here. Okay, so how do you improve testosterone? Well, basically it's healthy living, I mean, intense exercise, you know, good quality protein, good quality sleep, low carbohydrate diet, some of the extra magnesium can potentially help as well as extra zinc can potentially help. So it's a couple elemental supplements there as well. But basically it has to do with healthy living intense exercise, get protein in, low carbohydrate diet, quality sleep, all those help improve testosterone levels. Now, potentially testosterone replacement can help both men and women. And I think this is, you know, I say it kind of the bottom slide is controversial. It's really not controversial. It's like, no, it can really, as time goes on, we're seeing more and more evidence that testosterone replacement can be one of the things that really gives us an advantage to living a longer, healthier life. All right, cortisol. Mentioned this right at the beginning here. Cortisol, cortisol is basically our, our chronic stress hormone. So when we talk about chronic stress, when people talk about GM stress all the time, this is cortisol that we're talking about, which is a little different than the other stress hormones, which are acute stress hormones, adrenaline, noradrenaline. That's that fight or flight when it kicks in there. Okay. Cortisol is the chronic stress hormone. It's made by the adrenal glands and cortisol by itself, typically it makes you very resistant to weight loss and very prone to weight gain. Cortisol does tend to increase blood sugars, which then also increases insulin levels. Cortisol by itself can actually increase insulin levels. And it's not just secondary to the increase in the blood sugar. Cortisol itself can increase insulin levels. And it tends to then worsen insulin resistance. Again, insulin resistance, such a common problem, which leads to fat storage and weight gain. Okay, insulin turns on fat storage. And mainly turns on visceral fat storage. Visceral means around the belly. Okay, and on the internal organs, visceral is the internal organs as opposed to externally sitting just under the skin. Okay. All right, cortisol also tends to increase ghrelin levels. Ghrelin is a hormone that makes us feel hungry. And so ghrelin levels typically go down after sleeve gastrectomy, but you know, ghrelin levels tend to make us feel hungry. And so if uh, cortisol levels make ghrelin levels go up, then if typically we're stimulated to eat more, Hunger is poorly controlled. We tend to just, you know, graze. So what can you do to help with cortisol levels? Well, basically it's trying to figure out stress relievers. Okay, so whatever that means, relaxation techniques, deep breathing, yoga, meditation, religion, whatever, it, whatever works for you. These things are exercise is one of the best stress relievers. And so kind of anything that works for you to help break that chronic stress cycle is going to be helpful. Growth hormone. Okay, I have a whole webinar on growth hormone and one of these losing weight USA things. Growth hormone is produced by the pituitary gland. It tends to peak in our late teens, early 20s, and declines with age. Okay, but it's also a hormone we 
is essential. Growth hormone helps build lean body mass or muscle mass, keeps metabolism high as possible. And therefore, growth hormone, you could think, is potentially helpful for weight loss. Okay. Typically, growth hormone itself isn't given unless you have a definitive diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency. Okay. And the FDA regulates this very, very carefully. So getting growth hormone is incredibly expensive. I'm going to go into more detail on the, the webinar on growth hormone. It's very expensive and it takes a while to see results. So it can take, you know, six months to a year to actually see results with this. Um, and very carefully regulated by the FDA. So it is one of those that is kind of controversial treatment. All right. So how do we actually improve our own growth hormone? Can it be done? So there are ways to, there are some injectable growth hormone releasing factors. You'll see them advertised, especially in the anti-aging clinic, clinics and things like that. But there are other things we can do to help improve growth hormone release. Okay. Most of these I talk about all the time. Okay. Is that living, that old healthy living. Fasting is actually the best way to improve your own growth hormone release. And they've done a number of studies on this that show that fasting, you know, a 24-hour fast, a 24-hour fast can actually boost growth hormone levels by 100 to 200%. That's doubling or tripling kind of the amount of growth hormone your body makes. And that's just from one day of fasting itself. So kind of fasting and making it part of a healthy lifestyle can be an important part of improving growth hormone release. The other thing that improves growth hormone is just exercise itself, especially strenuous exercise. The more intense, the better it works. Since growth hormone is released in a pulsatile fashion, typically the, it's mo mainly released in our deepest sleep. So really, really early in the morning when we're in our deepest sleep, that's when growth hormone is released. Typically, and it's difficult to measure growth hormone because you have to catch it during the release and the half-life is very short. So therefore, kind of, uh, if you were to measure it, just, you know, get a growth hormone level in your bloodstream, just a random one, it might be, you don't even notice it. It's like, yeah, it's really low, but it's not really real. In order to really look at total growth hormone, you'd have to do a 24-hour urine collection, set it up for special studies to kind of figure this out. But there are things we can do again to improve growth hormone, like fasting, strenuous exercise, deep sleep, because that's when our, our, our Best sleep is our will release our growth hormone the most. But then there's also some possible enhancers, extra B vitamins, inositol, which is one of the things that's in our B12 injections with the MIC, the I is inositol. It can help with growth hormone release, but just inositol is kind of like a B vitamin. Okay. Minerals, um, chromium, magnesium, zinc, and measure magnesium and zinc I mentioned with testosterone, as well as iodine. So all these can help improve growth hormone release. Some amino acids, so like taking some extra amino acids might be helpful. Um, other hormones, uh, pro hormones like DHEA, melatonin, um, estradiol, testosterone, thyroid, progesterone, they all potentially can help improve uh, growth hormone release. It's just that you may get other side effects from those things too. There's some no number of herbal things that can, herbal concoctions that are out there. Um, other things that can be helpful just from your own lifestyle standpoint, avoiding alcohol, uh, avoiding caffeine, uh, avoiding sugar, uh, avoiding milk products. You know, all of those tend to make worse growth hormone release. And then there are a few things that actually inhibit growth hormone release. And typically it's the same things we talk about all the time. Carbohydrate, high carbohydrate diet with high insulin levels is going to inhibit growth hormone release. So again, low carbohydrate diet, still a better avenue as well as kind of controlling stress. Anytime we're way under uh, uh, cortisol levels being fairly high, um, it inhibits cortisol, inhibits the release of growth hormone. 
All right, now I mentioned fasting a couple of times. I just want to throw this out there. It's kind of a, you know, fasting, I'm a big fan of fasting. It's immediately available to anyone because it's just skip a meal. Okay, it's not like, you know, anybody can do that. All right, doesn't mean it's easy, but it is simple. There's no doubt about it. The, it's about the simplest thing you can do is don't eat. I'm telling you to not, not do something, okay? So it's very, very simple. It is effective. There's not a way for it not to work. It doesn't cost anything. It's free. It's free. You can do as much as you want to then. It's free. Anybody can do it. It's certainly convenient because we don't have to do anything. I'm telling you to do nothing. Okay. It's very flexible because you can add it in however you want to. It's just like, you know, nobody has to know that you're fasting. And then when you want to break the fast, go ahead and break the fast. You don't have to tell anybody. So it's very flexible. You can literally do it with any diet. You know, I think a low cup diet. It's the best plan to do it, but still, you can do it with any type of a diet. Okay? One of the best things about fasting is that it teaches hunger tolerance. A lot of times, people will interpret hunger as a life threatening problem. Hunger is just a sensation. That's all it is. It's not a life threatening problem. Okay? Hunger is not starvation. Those are two different things. Okay? So it teaches hunger tolerance in that you realize that, hey, you know, just because I missed a meal, it's not the end of the world or anything like that. And it literally has unlimited power. You control it. You decide when I'm going to do it, how long I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it. So it, it, literally it's unlimited power for you. It's, I'm a big fan of fasting. I have webinars that talk about fasting itself. All right, ghrelin. Ghrelin's a minor hormone, but it's an important hormone. It's produced mainly by the body of the stomach, and therefore it's one of the reasons why a sleeve gastrectomy will remove about three quarters of the stomach. Ghrelin levels go way down. Ghrelin tends to make you hungry. So it's released as the further out you get from a meal. So it tends to be increased when the stomach is empty. It also tends to single, uh, signal to hunger to the brain, into the, the hypothalamus, which I mentioned right at the beginning of this webinar. So ghrelin tends to increase hunger and stimulate eating. And ghrelin levels tend to increase with stress and poor sleep. So we'd like to try to control those things to control ghrelin levels as well. Leptin, also another minor hormone. Leptin is kind of the counterpart to ghrelin. Ghrelin makes us hungry. Leptin tends to make us feel satisfied. It doesn't make us feel full. The satisfied is a little different, but it's kind of like I've had enough. Okay. And leptin is actually produced and released by fat cells. And leptin, and when it's released by the fat cells, works on the brain. Part of the problem, though, is that many people are leptin resistant. And so subsequently then, gee, they make plenty of leptin, but... Okay, the brain isn't receiving the message. Okay, and so therefore the brain's not turning off that kind of, hey, it, you're done eating. All right, HCG, I mentioned this earlier, kind of a very, it's fairly controversial as far as a weight loss medication. It's basically extracted from pregnant woman's urine. Okay, and in theory, it can help with weight loss. How? Well, in men, we know it can increase testosterone production. In women, it potentially, and men as well, can it help but preserve lean body mass and potentially can appetite, act like an appetite suppression. Typically needs to be given by injection. Um, you'll, you'll sometimes see it advertised that you put this under your tongue and it's absorbed. Unfortunately, HCG is a very large molecule and it doesn't really absorb well submucosally. So if you put it under your tongue, it's like, yeah, or you take it as a pill, it's not going to be absorbed well. So kind of it's definitely sold that way. And but you know how well it actually works. There is something to it, but I don't think it's there are better ways to lose weight than utilizing HCG. Some of the injectable newer weight loss medications are a better way to lose weight. We know they work. And we can tell with those, I should probably mention those, those are incretin hormones, those new injectables. Um, they definitely work, but they're not necessarily, those aren't necessarily produced the way these other hormones that we can actually manipulate are. All right, so in summary then, hormones get our messengers to your tissues, instructing them what 
to do. And they're messages your body cannot ignore. So the tissues in your body can't ignore the message that it receives. And so if it's being told to store fat, it will store fat. And some of the strongest instructions come from what we eat and what we do. And the, this part of it actually has very little to do with how many calories you're taking in. So kind of the, how our lifestyle is will affect this. And we can manipulate these hormones to help with weight loss then. All right. So, yep, yeah, hormones can be manipulated through thyroid. Extra iodine, thyroid support, extra selenium for decreasing insulin. It's you know, fasting, low carbohydrate diet, low calorie diet, exercise, those are the big ones. Decreasing cortisol, which also decreases insulin, quality sleep, relaxation techniques, those are the big ones. Then testosterone and growth hormone exercise are very important for both of those. Quality sleep good sources of protein, low carbohydrate diet, extra magnesium, zinc, B vitamins can help avoiding much alcohol, avoiding caffeine, avoiding sugar, and avoiding potentially some people are sensitive to milk products as well. Fasting, one of the best ones to actually increase growth hormone, and then potentially you can consider bioidentical hormone replacement. That's part of also what we do here as well. But you can manipulate some of these without actually having true hormone replacement then too. All right, don't see the questions that are sitting out there. So if you have questions, obviously pick up the phone, give us a yell, tune into these webinars, you can ask them whenever. All right, make sure you're stopping into the center, get the body comp checked, log into the membership portal. You should be receiving the weight loss tips as well as the weekly recipes. Tune in each Tuesday, 12.15 for the next webinar. Watch your email for the invite and link. And remember, it's your life. Make it a healthy one. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.